Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, and thank you, Buckley. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. We have a uh, discussion related to the fan products on top of the facility. So let's begin by first going over what we have today and a little bit of what's on deck for Friday. Today, my intent is to talk more about fan fundamentals of the lab and then best practices. Friday, we will get more into energy savings, which uh, redundancy, as well as different sequences of operation for laboratory exhaust systems. My name is Matt Gedke, and as Dean mentioned, we will be able to take some questions at the end. I have been at GreenX since 1994, uh, dealing with anything from commercial products to industrial products, and the last 12 years have been specifically focused on laboratory exhaust systems. My background in, from, for education is uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, so a Badger plus a Packer fan, and um, have a Master's of Business from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So our learning objectives today are very, very straightforward. We're going to talk about laboratory exhaust fundamentals. And as you see on this photo at the right, you know, our equipment is generally on top of the roof deck. We'll explain the different styles of products, how they interact with what Antec is doing inside of the building. We will talk about different equipment, so comparisons of inlines and blowers and different nozzles. And to do that, I will jump into what we call our virtual lab program. So we'll, we'll jump back and forth from um, PowerPoint. And then I will wrap up with best practices. And, and having been in the industry for you know 25 plus years, you see a lot of things, opportunities that could have make, made installations better. So I'll share some of the highlights of things that I think can improve or, or considerations you have specifically related, related to acoustics, operation, and to some extent, energy savings as well. So this diagram from the ASHRAE Laboratory Design Guide does a great job explaining what this is all about. So when you have a lab space like what many of you are seeing being added out in the New England market, and quite frankly, we're seeing this all across North America uh, due to pandemic and the, the obvious need for more research on, on a variety of different subjects. But ultimately, you end up having research, whether it's chemical fume hoods or a process inside of a space. We have workers, researchers around that process, and we want to make sure the air is clean inside of that facility. So we extract all those fumes and odors and bring them up and above our facility. Now, after we've do done all that work, what we want to make sure is that effluent, in this case coming out of the stack, doesn't just go back into our building through air intake A and B. So it's safety in our building, on top of our building. And then many of you are creating lab spaces that are in, that might be on a campus, there might be other facilities around your particular building. We want to make sure that it's safe for our neighbors as well. So truly a life safety application, making sure if you're in that space on top of the roof deck or bringing air in or in an adjacent building, you're not running into contaminated fumes or odors. Now, there are two key requirements that define really what these products look like in terms of their overall shape. ANSI Z95 as well as NFPA45. Let's start first with NFPA45. So you can see this gentleman standing on a concrete slab up on top of the building, and there is a lab package in front of him as well as behind him. So what NFPA45 does is says that stack discharge needs to be 10 feet or three meters off of the roof deck. So that gives you a stack to help get that effluent up and away. Plus it helps prevent anyone from you know, sticking their heads or hands in the airstream to feel what's coming out of the discharge of the fan. Clearly if there's contaminants, we want to avoid that at all cost. ANSI Z95 then has to do with the overall discharge velocity. So notice that there's a conical shaped discharge at the end of the fan. And what that does is accelerate air up to 3000 feet per minute or more as it exits the discharge of the fan stack. So that stack height plus that momentum of air coming out of that stack helps us create plume rise and prevents it from getting back into our space. Now I've highlighted something here. You can see minimum velocity to be written out of ANSI Z95. In fact, I've seen the, 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 the most recent uh, printing of Z95 and it has been removed. So part of the challenge there is that 3000 feet per minute is not 
the silver bullet answer to any lab. In some cases, you might need higher velocities. Some cases, you might be low, need lower velocities, and or, or you're allowed to go to lower velocities in 3,000, which can help drive down the cost of operation. So, really, what this is, you know, tending to do is force engineers like yourself to look at a third-party wind weight consultant to validate if your velocity and your, your your unit heights are safe for a given application, you know, based on wind speeds, uh, based on what's coming out of your particular facility. So my recommendation is particularly on your small labs, you know, not all folks are going to pay $100,000 for a wind wake uh, work because it just isn't required in a lot of cases. You know, stick to that 3,000 feet per minute or more as we've done in the past. But as your labs become more complex or intertwined with the community and other buildings, uh, make sure that you do consult a wind wake consultant to, to validate that you have a safe application on your particular facility. Now, I, I dropped this document in because I'm seeing more and more in the market where some of the lab suppliers are doing some things that are actually frowned upon in terms of safely exhausting that L, that effluent out of the space. So this is uh, basically out of the ASHRAE design guide, um, section figure 9.8. And if you check out this screen, it looks, there's best designs, you know, middle of the road designs, and then poor should not be used. Let's, let's start with the poor. Uh, clearly, as I as I indicated, when we take all this energy to get that effluent up to the top of the roof deck, the idea of having a gooseneck, you know, simply doesn't make sense, right? Pouring that effluent like a shower back down on the roof deck, you know, contradicts the whole goal here. But what I am seeing more and more are these hinged covers or stack caps, you know, which is good for rain prevention from getting inside of a stack, but it's very, uh, it, it really can negatively impact the flow as it's trying to exit and go up above the building. Definitely not recommended. As you work your way up to the top, and I'll just look to the second unit here on the left, a simple stack with a conical nozzle is really the recommended approach. And a common question I will receive is, hey, how do we deal with rain? So when the fan is operating and there's you know air coming out of that nozzle, it's going to deal with moisture and just blow it away. If that fan happens to be redundant or just sitting there, any water that does get into the stack, the fans will have drain assemblies to ensure water doesn't get into the building. It just drains out on top of the roof deck into a safe collection location. Simple as that. Now, of course, our goal is to maximize that plume rise. So I'm gonna share with you a couple equations that are used in the industry to help predict how high that plume is as it exits the discharge of the fan. So the first is the modified Briggs equation, which has been around for a long, long time. And what this is, is a simple mass flow problem. Three times velocity times diameter divided by the wind speed. So as our velocity of 3000 feet per minute or higher goes up, of course the plume goes up. And as the diameter of that stack gets bigger and bigger, it's going to increase the plume rise as well. Mass flow problem, just get more effluent out. It's going to have the mass flow momentum to carry it higher. In the denominator is wind speed. So wind speed can be very challenging if you're in an area where you have high winds, coastal areas, for example. Very recently in Wisconsin, we've had excessive winds. But you can see on this document from left to right ac across the page, we're taking that plume and, and we're moving it across. And that can certainly be a factor if your makeup air system is downstream or there's neighboring buildings downstream. So this is a very simple point of uh, plume above the top of that discharge of the stack. You can do the math very simply and say, yeah, my plume rise is going to be 38 feet plus the height of the unit. Very simple to use. Now, this has been replaced by ASHRAE in roughly the 2011 time frame with what's called the momentum flux equation or set of equations. Momentum flux is much more conservative. You'll generally find that the point of height of plume is you know, 25, 30% less than the Briggs equation. And as you pour through all of these equations, you'll start to see some X variables. So what this does, in addition to giving us a point of height, it starts to tell us what happens as we move downwind. You know, how high does that plume actually get? You know, if there's an adjacent building or an air intake. The other thing momentum flux adds is different train categories. 
So if you are in um, an urban area with a lot of other buildings around your particular lab, there are factors that can help tell us the plume is going to be higher or lower than if you're in a field essentially where you know just a, a building in a with no obstructions, your plume is going to naturally be higher. So it attempts to take all of these factors into account. And the the description that you get if you go through all of these formulas is kind of a neat graph. A neat graph, and what you'll find here, if you look across the x-axis from zero up to 120 feet downstream, and in the y-axis from zero up to 19 feet, you get two sets of curves. H sub x is basically that plume as it exits the stack, and the wind starts to pull it across horizontally, horizontally across the the landscape. So this plume is going to rise but it's also gonna have some lateral movement to it as well. That's what the H sub X curve is. Now, what momentum flux also does is say, okay, we're not gonna let this H sub X go up to infinity. We're going to put a, a, a stack factor on it or a cap on it so that it can only go so high and that's going to be the limit of the height. And in this case, that H sub F is just over 14 feet. So as you get 70 feet downstream, momentum flux will say, you know what? The, the, basically, this is about a 14-foot plume rise coming out of the top of the stack. So if we have a 10-foot unit per NFPA 45 and we add the 14 feet, the effective plume rise of that system is 24 feet. And that's how we end up doing the math. Now, the momentum flux has a bunch of equations, as you saw. Most fan manufacturers have a combination of the Briggs or the momentum flux in their selection program. So you can pick and choose. Just make sure that if you're comparing two different graphs that you're using the same equations because as I noted, momentum flux is much more conservative than what we see with the Briggs equation. Now there's some other neat things that come along with these tools from ASHRAE. They have a plume concentration modeling set of equations. So you can literally go in, work with the momentum flux and uh, within Excel and you can plot a chart just like what we have here where it has zero to up to 150 feet. Then you can see in the y-axis, basically up to 60 feet in this particular case, and you can notice this black curve, that's the momentum flux curve that's rising up to infinity. And what these plume concentration modeling formulas can start to tell us is how the concentration of effluent breaks up as it goes downstream as it separates from that core plume coming out of the stack itself, which is very useful. Let's say we're anywhere from 60 to 120 feet downstream and there's an air intake, basically 30 feet above the roof deck. You know, what this model will tell us is that there are no issues with this particular system. I have the right, based on a concentration in this case of 10%, my nozzle velocity, my plume rise gives us a safe application. You know, once you start getting up into that 40 or 50 feet as you move downstream though, it, become, it can become more of a problem. So you wanna evaluate your percentage. In this case, I did 10%, which quite frankly is quite high. You know, we have zero to 10% as, as your options, but maybe you need to have a stack extension, increased nozzle velocity. But ultimately what this allows you to do is play with these parameters and make sure that you're coming out of the gates with a safe model for your particular facility. This does not replace contacting a wind wake consultant to validate your overall assumptions to ensure, to ensure you have you know, a safe environment on your bigger lab systems. But again, it is a tool to get you out of the gates in the right direction. A little about the lab systems themselves. We have old lab designs, which are transitioning to new lab designs. And by old lab designs, you know, what we used to see what are called fan farms. We would have 50 lab hoods inside of a building and each would have their own riser going up to their own individual fan up on top of the roof deck. So if I had 50 chemical fume hoods, there'd be 50 risers, 50 roof penetrations, and 50 fans, which is slick. I mean, if one hood is down, you can trace that riser up to the roof deck. You know, maybe the belts are not, maybe the fan's not even running and you can make your adjustments and get that particular hood up and running. But as I mentioned now, there are 50 fans to take care of, 50 roof penetrations that could allow water into the building. And if you think of it in terms of the Briggs equation, that mass flow problem, I have a small fan doing a small amount of air. There's not a lot of mass flow and momentum to give us a safe exit velocity. So you might get plumes of three or four or five feet on these little systems, which can be a problem up on top of your roof deck. 
what we're seeing is the conversion to these manifolded systems. So you still might have 50 hoods, 100 hoods, but instead of having their own individual riser to an individual fan, now all these chemical fume hoods are tied into a common riser. They're doing like exhaust, but again, instead of 50 fans, I might have three or four bigger fans that are handling all of this effluent. And there are a lot of advantages to that. You know, less roof penetrations, generally just one now, one big duct that's feeding these three fans, which means less fans to maintain, less roof penetrations as well. If you think about it in terms of plume rise, bigger diameter, doing 3,000 feet per minute or more, much more mass flow momentum to take that effluent above the building. So these fans allow us to really crank that jet above the space, you know, to make it safe up on top of our roof deck. You know, other things that I see that come along for the ride though, are the ability that some of these, these hoods might be in use Others are just sitting there idle, pulling through clean air. So you actually get a lot of dilution of the high contaminant hoods by the time it reaches the fans themselves. So what I end up seeing is that in many cases, these ductworks are galvanized because the air is relatively clean. So I'd mentioned on my previous concentration model, I had 10% contaminant. You know, that's quite frankly pretty high, but that could be the case if you have a real, um, if you have a system where you're over a process and where there is a lot of fumes, but in a lab, it's pretty rare that all of the hoods are being utilized at the same time. Some are being used, some are clean, some are shut down. Now, when you do this type of system, it's important that we don't have, you know, research between two chemical fume hoods that don't agree with each other when they merge up in this manifold system. So like research, not really an issue. Things like radioisotopes, perchloric acid, you know, you wanna keep them off on their own. So while we have a number of fans that are manifolded or hoods that are manifolded in this case, we still do have systems that are off to their side. You know, these again, perchlorics in particular, very nasty stuff, it has to be treated with in a unique way so that we don't have issues within the ductwork and the fan itself. But they'll be off to their side, they'll handle their specialties and more of the general exhaust will be pulled together. And by doing this, it allows us to change how we operate the systems. So let's talk about constant volume and then we'll merge into variable volume systems then jump into our virtual lab. Constant hey, volume, yes. I, uh, sorry to interrupt, but there were a couple questions that I that I thought um, maybe we could address right now. Uh, and they're, they have to, they both have to do with the, um, Cross contamination and and concentration that you've been talking about um, on the yeah on the concentration graph does the red region above the momentum flux curve represent concentration at low or zero wind speed? Okay, so what this takes in is all the parameters that you would have entered into momentum flux, uh, ten miles per hour wind speed. In this case, I have ten per that my concentration level leaving that exhaust stack is at ten percent. So I have a pretty high concentration of chemicals coming out. So you can change all of those parameters. You can change the surface roughness, the terrain category, all of those factors that you can deal with momentum flux. This then just takes and plots and uses the equations out of ASHRAE to help you figure out that dispersion as that plume goes downstream. So it's kind of yes and no, Dean. You can, you can make those adjustments. But in this case, you can see the little legend on the bottom left here. I'm afraid to touch my screen. I don't want anything to mess up, but you can see the baby blue is 0%, and then it just sort of cranks up intensity where the dark red is you know, 10% um, concentration right at the discharge of the fan as you leave. Of course, you can imagine the highest concentration is there, and then it breaks down over time. Great. Um, and then the next one is, how do you avoid cross-contamination with a manifold exhaust system? Okay. You know what? That is a that's a great question, and really, what that comes down to, you know, here, here's the challenge. Many of you are, you know, you, you're making labs. And you might not even know who the clients are, right? So we, we don't we don't even know that answer in many cases. Other times you do. That's obviously easier. So if it's an owner that you've worked with for years, or it's uh, pharmaceutical, you know who it is. You know what you're dealing with in those cases. Um, so I, I I don't again like. Unfortunately, I don't always have a silver bullet answer, but the environmental health and safety 
person responsible for this really needs to make it clear as part of your design. You know, obviously they don't want to have perchloric mixing in with other things. So it needs to be defined up front. What are these hoods dealing with? So that you as engineers, when you merge things together, you're not creating a future hazard. So it's it's it probably comes down to really good communication of you know who's in that building. Hopefully you know that, and sometimes you don't. And then when that system is developed, you might have to define and say, hey, you know what, this this was a generically designed system that allows a mixture. Make sure that whatever you're doing in your in your hoods in this particular case, you know, play nice together when the system is up and operational. The other option, I guess, is is clearly as I show here, maybe you have two different sets of manifolded systems. I mean, that's an option as well. Certainly, could be more expensive way to to attack the problem. Okay, Dean, anything else you want to hit here? Uh, I guess while we're at it, um, <laughs> did have one more come in here. Uh, sure. What is the plume height goal? Is there a standard height? That is a great question. And, you know, the plume height goal depends on every particular building and what's around your, around your facility. You know, if you have a lab that's just literally out in the field and there is nobody around you, not a big deal. If there's clean air coming out of the lab most of the time, you might have a different answer. If that lab has high concentrations of chemicals, just as you would imagine, it's nasty stuff, the wind's blowing into your makeup air system, then you start to care a heck of a lot more, right? So it just all depends on the type of lab, what you're dealing with, what those concentrations are, and, and what's around your building. Um, and, and that's part of the challenge if you're just, you know, making a, uh, you know, core and shell type lab and you're not sure who that customer base is. Other times you know who that customer base and what you're dealing with. And that's obviously where a wind wake consultant can come in as well. And, um, and I, I know many of you are working on labs that are in highly congested areas, a lot of people around that building. And, and I think the money spent to get that, that sign off from a wind wake consultant is very, very much worth it. Whereas a high school where they might be using a Bunsen burner and boiling some water, you know, clearly you don't want to spend an extra hundred thousand dollars to do a, do an analysis on that. So it's knowing your customer, knowing the lab, and then, you know, uh, the criticalness of what you're dealing with. Okay, Dean, anything else we want to hit? No, that was great. Continue on. All right. So constant volume versus variable volume. Very quickly, here is a constant volume chemical fume hood. And I have it tied to a riser to an individual fan. Once I turn that fan on, air is being pulled through this hood at the speed or flow that that fan wants to pull it. And whether the sash is open or closed, air comes through that hood. It either goes through the sash or when my sash is closed, like night times or weekends, that same amount of volume can go through the bypass air drill. So when this fan is running, air is exiting that space, uh, whether I'm using that chemical fume hood or not. So very limited controls, very simple. The fan's always happy. You know, happy fans are great. It's pulling it out 3,000 feet per minute. Everything's wonderful. Where this becomes a problem is if I have 100 of these hoods in a building and you all experienced 90 degree weather the last couple of days, and I always have 100% air leaving this space, whether somebody's in that lab or not, it costs a lot of money to bring in outside air and cool it and dehumidify it and get it to the appropriate conditions for that particular lab. So this is good for small labs, maybe where the hoods aren't dominant, but it's probably not ideal for big systems where the hoods can you know, literally change the climate in your building. It costs a lot of money to operate. So we switched to variable volume chemical fume hoods. Notice no more bypass grill. So when this sash opens and closes, other things have to change to accommodate that change um, in area of the sash. And by that I mean, when this sash is open, generally you're trying to maintain, you know, I see anywhere from 60 to 100 feet per minute across that sash opening. So when the sash is fully open, I need more volume to maintain 100 feet per minute. And as I close that sash, less volume because the area is less. So I'm gonna switch across to our virtual lab where we can show this a little bit versus all of my hand gyrations here. And I have three variable volume chemical fume hoods. You can see the red arrows, that's the exhaust air going out. I can open and close sashes. 
Above each of these, you see a little valve that's opening and closing along with that sash opening. Uh, much like what we talked about yesterday with the Antec, that's where their, their valves come into play to help us to help us control that flow. We'll talk about that in a second. I have a snorkel on the left. I have a storage cabinet on the left. All of these red arrows are exiting this space, going into a common manifold. And in this case, I'm only exhausting out of one fan, but it could be multiple fans up on top of that building. This just happens to be a small fan with no redundancy. Red arrows exhaust, blue arrows on the right are supply coming in. So that really defines our first control loop in this lab. It's maintaining negative pressure in the space. At least that's the most common approach. So if I was in here and I spill something, we want that spill contained and exhausting out of the exhaust system versus exfiltrating to the rest of the building. Now that would be bad. So ultimately what's happening is I have more blue arrows leaving the space than red arrow, or, sorry, red arrows leaving the space versus blue arrows entering the space to maintain a negative inside of that particular lab. So that's control loop number one. Control loop two has to do with the sash position and how this little valve works above. So right now when we're in 100% exhaust. When I close the sash, notice that little damper closes. I close the second sash, same thing happens. And I open, that little valve opens. So ultimately what's happening here, the easiest way to do this is we have a sash sensor that says, okay, my sash is open. I need this valve open to a point that I get the appropriate volume through that maintains 100 feet per minute. And when I close the sash to any position, it tells this actuated device to close to a certain level to maintain 100 feet per minute or whatever velocity you're looking for for your experimentation. Of course, when I open it, it has to react quickly to pull air such that it's safe for the researcher adjacent to that chemical fumarate. And that, that's Antec's specialty, you know, making sure the appropriate flow is coming through that hood and exhausting, in this case, into our common manifold. Now, the third loop then has to do with this little green light. So notice when I close a sash, that valve closes, this little green light turns red. So what's happening? Ultimately, what we're doing is we have a a, a, we're, we're monitoring, monitoring pressure in this ductwork. So I have a fan on top of the facility pulling air out of the space. I close the sash, which shuts down the valve, and then all of a sudden I have less available air in this duct to feed this fan. So we introduce what's called a bypass plenum. That's this box on the bottom of the fan with a bypass damper. And what that bypass damper does all day long is modulate to bring in outside air or bring in less outside air to ensure we have a consistent duct pressure. So when I close the sash, not enough flow, I'm gonna bring in outside air through that damper to make up for this lack of air coming through my chemical fume hood. When I close a second sash, more outside air. When I close a third sash, now I'm basically making up three hoods worth of air through a bypass damper up on top of the facility. Now, good news and bad news. Why does this help our situation? Let's first talk about that pressurization in the space. When I'm at 100% exhaust, that means I'm at 100% supply as well. So watch the blue arrows as I close sashes. You know, quite frankly, it's as simple as less air leaves the space, that means less air comes into the space. So when there is no research, research and we close the sashes, I'm able to then turn down my supply side which saves significant energy nights, weekends, or whenever research is not happening in that particular space. Fantastic, that's what it's all about. I guess the downside of this is that my fan is still utilizing the same amount of energy. Instead of pulling all the air from the lab though, it's pulling air from outside and just mixing. So I'm getting some natural dilution, which is great, but it hasn't impacted the, the amp draw of this fan. I'm still doing the same amount of work. Now, what I could do is apply a variable frequency drive to this fan as well. So when I close sashes, just simply slow the fan down to tie in with demand. Now, think back to that Briggs equation, three times velocity times diameter. We have a static diameter. As my variable frequency drive decreases speed, or I, I go from 60 to 50 to 40 hertz and my fan RPM goes down, velocity is directly proportional. So my plume is going to come down as well. So if you do look at a variable frequency, variable frequency drive, just make sure you realize as you slow that 
VFD down, your plume is coming down as well, and you don't want to obviously want to have an unsafe roof deck just for the sake of saving energy. You know, so keep that in mind. Now let's quickly look at the fans so that you understand the different styles. This particular fan is an inline fan. So I have a bypass damper and bypass plenum. You see my isolation damper here. Rotating impeller of the fan, it's direct drive, the motor's in a bifurcated opening. And when I say inline tubular, it's a tubular fan, the air is literally going inline through that product. Really great solution, very common solution on laboratory spaces. The advantages of this type of system is that they take up very little footprint on the roof deck, more of a skyscraper. Disadvantage is that access to the motors and the drive elements can be anywhere from six to eight feet off the roof deck. They, they just get really tall. 10 feet is no issue on this type, type of product, I mean, exceeding 10 feet. It can be 10, 15, 20 feet tall, depending on how, how large you go. So you wanna have provisions for serviceability. Maybe that's a catwalk. Make sure you don't drop them next to an 11 story drop off on your building because you need access to maintain these for the, for the maintenance people you know, long-term to ensure everything stays up and operational. So that is an inline fan, very efficient, nice product, very well used. The alternative is a blower style. So here is an airfoil industrial blower. This one again has the bypass plenum with the bypass damper. Everything functions the same. I shut a sash, air comes in through that damper, no difference in terms of operation. Now, in terms of pros and cons, very consistent with inline fans in terms of sound and energy usage. You're not going to find a lot of difference between those two. The advantage though is all of your drive elements are right at, are right at the roof deck level. You, know, you pull this guard off, you have access to the motors, the shaft, the bearings, without getting six to eight feet off of the ground. Disadvantage is that it takes up more real estate on top of your building because the bypass plenum is adjacent to the fan. So it could take twice the area. So if you have a lot of footprint, a great fan that'll fit on your space. If you have so, a lot of other HVAC, HVAC stuff on top of your building, you know this fan just might literally not fit. In terms of the nozzle styles, we'll go back and we'll look through these quickly. I have a dilution style nozzle, which has been the most common nozzle that I've seen on labs for 30 years, from Strobeck to MK to Greenheck. You know, most manufacturers have some type of dilution nozzle and wind band. How does this work? As the air in this inline fan hits the nozzle, the nozzle is below this wind band. The wind band is the lampshade type device. We accelerate that air to very high levels. You know, we talked about ANSI Z95, talking about 3,000 feet per minute. In this case, you'll typically see anywhere from five to 7,000 feet of nozzle velocity because the higher the nozzle velocity, the more of these little green dilution arrows that come in and mix within the wind band. So the pros to that are that we're diluting what's coming out of the lab. So I have a 12,000 CFM fan. I can have 24 to 30,000 CFM of air coming out of the top, which significantly dilutes whatever's coming out of your lab space. So if it's a vivarium or you have high concentrations, fumes, odors, this really works well. Especially, you know, if the wind is blowing and that air has a propensity to go into your makeup air systems. Great solution. Disadvantage, when you're running things at five to 7,000 feet per minute, that can create sound. That creates additional horsepower. So it's gonna drive your motor requirements up, which drives your electrical and long-term operating costs up as well. So just be cognizant of that, that you don't overjuice your velocity to get higher plume at the cost of higher energy and higher sound if you don't have to. These fans work really, really well, but you know you can find yourself in trouble if again, if you over uh, overshoot the velocity coming out of the nozzle. The alternative nozzle is just simply a high plume nozzle. Like I showed you on that um, ASHRAE lab design guide, a simple stack with a conical nozzle works really, really well. So in this particular case, there is no dilution. So if I have 12,000 through the fan, there's 12,000 coming out of the top of the stack. But what I find with this nozzle is I can get equal or higher plume rise, which is the ultimate goal, but it uses less energy and the sound levels are less. So generally when I go to this type of nozzle, I'm one motor size less, which means all of your electrical can be downsized, which means the capital expenditure and long-term energy usage is less as well. Plus this nozzle is far 
less expensive to manufacture than a dilution, which again helps out on the budget. You know, if there's if they're looking to VE or they're looking at the lowest costs, very very hard to beat this style of product. Now I'm showing you inline fans, but the same can be done on the blowers as well. So here's a high plume on a on a blower. You can mix a dilution as well. Last nozzle I'll spend here just a minute on is called a variable geometry nozzle. Variable geometry nozzles have an in-flight adjustable nozzle that changes with the flow coming through our fan. So when we are talking about our variable flow out of a lab, I close a sash. The routine approach is to open the bypass damper. But if we want to safely apply a variable frequency drive, now when I close a sash, my fan speed is going to decrease my blades can change in flight so watch the blades as i close a second sash fan speed goes down because i need less flow out of my duct system my blades are going to close up on top so my nozzle area is less to maintain whatever velocity you need 3000 4000 or whatever safe for your application and when the hood begins to open we ramp up the fan speed again we monitor the flow through the fan we tell our nozzle go to the appropriate position to maintain whatever safe velocity. So again, this is an alternative, not for everybody. Uh, there's more maintenance, there are more controls, a little bit more expensive as well, but it allows you to vary the flow of the fan based on demand and maintain a consistent nozzle velocity. So that's a high level look at the fans. I'm gonna jump us back over to our PowerPoint presentation and we will talk a little bit more about the products and then some, some tricks that we've learned over the years to help make sure your labs operate effectively. Here is a fundamental um, look at what this is all about as we look at pre-engineered systems versus field fab. Great story, this was out in West Texas. I guess it depends what you consider great. It's an interesting story. 1,000 CFM utility sets, one in front, one in back. And I see a lot of drawings of these systems. This is a very popular layout, in this case, a small constant volume lab. But what I don't see on the paper or the design is an inlet box with a hole cut out of it, inexplicable elevation changes, stacks that are too short. So normally, great engineer print has beautiful radius curved duct, goes right into the mouth of the fan, everything's perfect, height's perfect, but between paper and on the roof in this case, and in many cases, things change. You know, why do you put a hole in a box? Because it's cheap. Why was there an inexplicable elevation change? My only thought is they forgot, the contractor forgot they needed isolators, so they had to make an adjustment at the end and they had to make it twice. The end result was both fans, 1000 CFM, both were coming in at 750. So we had a 25% reduction in flow, which caused alarms, things didn't work good, obviously a lot of problems. So as opposed to fixing the problem, they bought new motors, bought new drives, increased the speed of the fan, and forever, this owner is going to pay for more energy, and, and both of these fans are going to be as they're going to be louder. I mean, they're just running faster, providing, um, you know, to overcome the system effects. And obviously, that's not what we want to do. And along the way, multiple people are on the phone for three weeks trying to figure out how to find 250 CFM. Waste of time. With pre-engineered, all we as manufacturers need is whatever your processes or your hoods, what is that external static pressure up to this curb? How much flow are you needing? And then we take care of everything else. Nozzle pressure drop, if you have energy recovery, if there's filters, dampers, all of those are part of our fan performance because it's a system. And if we know what you need, we can cover what we need and make sure when this fan is selected, installed and commissioned, we all get on and off the job faster and you have a working and safe installation when it's all said and done. We're way too busy, all of us, to be spending three weeks trying to find 250 CFM. So keep that in mind with your pre-engineered systems. Plus you get the AMCA certification. Um, and in our case and in many manufacturers, no guy wires. So you don't have all these roof penetrations that are wind load rated. It seems most manufacturers have these 125 now an hour wind loads, which, which again makes life easier for everybody uh, and makes your roof deck cleaner. Hey, and this is West Texas. They had a lot of room. A lot of the roof decks, there's hardly any room to even put guide wires at an appropriate angle. We talked about the fan styles. We, we, 
with where we're at in terms of time, just realize these nozzles are all interchangeable on different types of fans. Not a problem. You can apply, you know, the bypass plenums as well. Um, I love this photo. So just quickly, I'd mention inline tubular fans fitting in congested roof decks. This classifies as a congested roof deck. A lot of duct, pretty interesting. Um, you know, I, I suspect it's a little difficult to uh, maintain a few of those products, but this this gives you a, a you know a, a good view point of view of how these inline fans can fit in the tight areas. We see belt and direct drive. So on the left, belt shaft bearings pulleys. On the right, direct drive. I still see a pretty good mix throughout the United States on what customers want. The trend is definitely moving to direct drive because of the maintenance aspect of it. Uh, the popularity of VFDs, VFDs and motors are, are living together much, much better today than they have in the past. Plus now these direct drives, one year maintenance free. If you put too much grease, it's actually a problem. Normally people don't wanna put any grease in or change the belts. So we're all moving towards solutions that take less and less maintenance because facilities just don't have uh, the skilled talent they had in the past. So we wanna make sure these fans get up and running and you don't have to do much to take care of them. Again, great picture of a centrifugal system. It shows you the immensity of what these can be and how much footprint. This actually had inline silencers added and these had no problem hitting 10 feet. You can see that gentleman in the back. These were monster systems, took up a lot of real estate up on top of the building. Again, belt drive or direct. My trend is to see more of the direct drive simply because there's less maintenance required. The other thing I do like about the centrifugal version, you can see on the base of all of these, they have spring isolators. So normally the inline style tubular are hard mounted on a bypass plenum directly to a curb. There, there, there's no springs. You can put a spring curb underneath, but that's pretty rare. The centrifugal version lends itself well to have isolation under the four corners so the fan can move. And then we would introduce a flex connector between the fan and the statically mounted bypass plenum. So the fan can move, the plenum doesn't move. So um, either way works great. The direct drive fans are so, or, or excuse me, the tubular fans as well as the blowers are so finely balanced, you're not going to have a problem. And I'll show you some things about structure here in a few minutes, we'll, which will help out with any other, um, making sure that your roof structure uh, can absorb anything that's going on at the fan level. Spark resistant construction, obviously very, very important. AMCA, the Air Movement and Control Association defines different levels of spark resistance. And there are three of them. A, all aluminum or all non-ferrous, maybe it's a composite. Very, very rare. Shoot, I'd say less than one or 2% of fans are completely aluminum or something other than, you know, have some steel or, or ferrous element to it. You know, by far 98% have spark B, which is an aluminum wheel and then a, a rubbering around the shaft, or Spark C, which is an aluminum inlet venturi with a rubbering around the shaft. Most manufacturers have B or C as part of their common um, specifications. No big deal, you can get that pretty easily. A, you can get, but it's gonna be excessively expensive. Most customers don't need it. And 99% of the time, B or C gets the job done. Then we talked about multiple configurations to some extent already, but you can see one by one, which we showed on the virtual lab, you know, these can really plunk together to the extent that you want to. This will come into play when we talk Friday about staging of products, flipping fans on or off. So having more fans allows you to, again, sequence things to tune your fan demand based on what your system is requiring or to provide redundancy. And we'll, again, we'll spend a little more on that on Friday. Best practices, this is the fun stuff. What have we learned over the years that can make your systems work better? I love this photo. This is a semiconductor plant. That is not an unusually short guy. <laughs> He's standing next to the bypass plenum, but you get a feel for how big these systems are. In that case, the motor, shoot, that's probably eight, nine feet off the ground very easily in that particular case. So they obviously have a lot of opportunity there for a scaffolding or a ladder for servicing uh, checking the bolts on that particular unit but you get a feel for how big some of these systems can really become so let's talk about acoustical and vibration issues how can we avoid some of these problems we'll start first with sound so when you look at manufacturers data they normally give you two sets of data 
inlet sound, you know, what's coming from the inlet of the fan that would go back into the building, and outlet sound, what's coming directly out of the nozzle. And they would test, like, as if you were sitting up here most of the time, what does that sound? I mean, and that's useful, but the reality is not many people are hanging out up here. Most of them are adjacent. You're standing on the roof deck, there's a boundary line. So radiated sound is very, very important. And we publish that radiated sound so you know what's happening at your boundary line, at your night conditions to understand if it's going to be a problem from motor noise or casing radiated sound. Inlet is very important as well. And I'll show you a couple tricks that I've learned on the inlet side over the years that can help you out. But obviously this sound goes right back into your plenum, into your ductwork, back into the building. And that can obviously be a problem for researchers inside. The other sound not, that people don't always appreciate is bypass damper sound. That's coming out of our bypass. So let's go back to this big photo. These are 50,000 CFM fans a piece, but it's one running, one off. These bypass dampers can do 50 to 75% of that fan load. So in nights and weekends, I can be pulling in 25 to 35,000 CFM through that damper. And in those situations, the nights and weekends, that sound can actually dominate the fan itself. And if you don't treat it, that can become your so source of uh, complaints adjacent to the product versus what's coming out of the actual discharge in this particular case. So this is a test photo showing our fan inside of a chamber doing a radiated sound. Very reasonable to do. We can test all of that casing breakout sound, which is good to do. And then in terms of managing the sound, you know, there's outlet silencers, inline silencers. And then on the bottom here, I have a bypass attenuation for the bypass damper. So most manufacturers have solutions to this, and that'll be part of their selection data to validate, hey, what is that sound? What am I dealing with? Now, bottom line though, what I've seen that works the best, if you are in a critical space, say we can do a lot to treat that fan, we can make better fan selections that are quieter, but sometimes you need what you need. There's, there's a higher velocity to get that plume away from the building. Uh, screen walls are one of the most effective ways to treat that sound. So if the president lives to the right of this page, or if there's a sound sensitive area, having this screen wall break the casing sound that goes to the right or to the back helps immensely. This isn't one of those things that you throw up at the end because we have a sound problem. It needs to be a consideration up front because it has structural aspects that really need to tie into the building. But breaking that line of sight from the fan to anything adjacent to the product really, really is significant in the effectiveness um, of, of, of controlling that sound. Now I'd mentioned the inside noise. You know, there's a couple obvious things. If the president of a building is sitting on the top floor, best not put all of, you know, 100,000 CFM of exhaust fans over his or her office. That's going to cause problems. The other thing I see is on maybe a, an isolation room in a hospital or maybe a pharmacy, maybe lower level buildings. Many of your labs are bigger, you have big mechanical spaces, maybe not as much of an issue, but in, in smaller facilities we see where the fan is directly over the plenum. It's maybe five feet above the unit. So when that fan is running, sound just goes directly into that chemical fume hood and the researcher complains about 72 or 73 decibel sound. A really good solution to help that is to basically add a couple elbows this is, you know, blasphemy from a fan manufacturer. We want straight duct, but there are situations where having a couple elbows, a couple packless elbow silencers can really help. Very difficult to fix after the fan is installed, but adding that later in the game is a really good solution to make sure sound coming out of the inlet isn't impacting your, your, um, your, your chemical fume hood and the researcher in this particular case. Dunnage, very, very popular. And I have a great book for reference, Noise and Vibration Control for HVA Systems by Mark Schaefer. If you haven't or you don't have this, this is a great book to have just for general HVAC, specifically on sound and vibration. But basically what he has is some you know, common sense stuff. Um, and and you know, ultimately vibrating equipment that isn't well supported is bad. Makes sense. Unfortunately, we see a lot of cases, it's getting better and better, uh, where things aren't supported appropriately and it can cause a problem. So upper left, bad, as you add more structure underneath, certainly things get better. And I have an example of a system that was basically a big trampoline. 
big laboratory fume system, three fans, completely supported around the perimeter, the middle unsupported. And what ended up happening is when these fans ran, we took vibration analysis in the center, just like a trampoline is going up and down. So two fans run, the third fan just sits there and it shakes things, it transfers into the building and causes issues with bearings and other components. We obviously don't want to see this. We don't want to have, and you as designers, you don't want to have to deal with this. How they fixed this is they actually put more structure under the fans themselves. But keep that in mind, if you're dealing with dunnage, especially old buildings, make sure that you properly support these products so that you don't have that trampoline effect. Much, much harder to fix after the fact. Invasive flow stations, another common thing. Uh, fortunately, there's better solutions. But an example, I was on a facility out in Washington State, Puget Sound University, absolutely beautiful campus. And they had this horse, horseshoe concrete um, chem chemistry building, the middle beautiful area courtyard, a pack of three lab systems on one side and a pack of three on the other. And what they wanted to know is what's the flow coming through those fans. So they put aftermarket flow stations within the Venturi, just like you see on this photo here. So as the fan pulls air, these probes monitor, and then you can collect that data and analyze it. Unfortunately, what happened with these flow probes and what can happen on a fan is it created a pure 12 decibel tone, horrible. So when the air, it's almost like if you're blowing over the top of a bottle and you get that tone sound, that's what happened after they put the probes in. So I went to the site, analyzed what's going on. It doesn't even sound like a fan. They pull the probes, the sound goes away. Now their problem was they needed a means to still monitor the flow. So as opposed to these invasive flow stations, consider piezometer rings. These are airflow devices that fit within the venturi of the fan. There is no pressure drop, but they accurately get the pressure drop across the venturi, which is essentially a calibrated nozzle. On the right, you can see my calibration equation. So a, basically a, a test and balance contractor can take a, a magna helix, get this delta P, plug into that equation and they know exactly how that fan works, which is a fantastic approach. Without drilling, tapping holes in the duct system, we are actually applying this on all of our products standard now as a default option because especially on small like isolation rooms where you're doing two or 300 CFM, you know, 50 CFM of, of duct leakage out of 300 is a problem. We wanna make sure the fans are doing, and then you can backtrack and figure out, you know, where duct leakage is occurring uh, to make that commissioning process much, much faster. Uh, straight ductwork, very straightforward here. Um, you know, as I go back to, I like to see straight duct, inexplicable elevation change is a problem. Keep your velocities below 1500 feet per minute, avoid major duct changes going into the fan. Uh, your systems are going to work better as well. And then as a wrap up, as we look at where we're going next week, or excuse me, on Friday, energy recovery energy savings in general. So we see energy recovery used highly. I know in your market in particular, you have big Delta T's applying a coil to the exhaust, to the supply. So that 90 degree weather the other day, you could take a bit of the heat out of that and chill it before it gets into the building. Great opportunity in markets or markets like Wisconsin and well, a lot of different solutions from small cassette style to walk in boxes, you know, to Buckley providing custom energy recovery solutions to some of your big lab applications. A lot of ways we can solve those problems as well. And then finally, as we lead into Friday's session, we're gonna spend more time talking about ways to save energy. So today we covered a, a couple of them. You know, 3,000 feet per minute, is it the right answer or not? We know ANSI Z9, uh, ANSI Z95 is, is writing 3,000 feet per minute out because you might be able to go lower, which saves energy. Utilizing variable frequency drives, you know, but you're speeding, you slow the fan down, speed it up based on demand. Converting to variable air volume labs, avoiding bypass air if at all, if, if at all possible. But these other ones, wind speed, wind direction, concentration, all big trends that are working their way across the country. So we'll spend a lot more time talking about that, sequencing of products and how you can keep a safe lab and also drop the cost of operation.